Hello and welcome to the technical area. I am Adam Smith, ex-professional footballer and ex-manager in the game of football or soccer as you may know it. I am currently the sporting director at Central Valley Fuego in USL League One. The technical area is a marked zone next to the field where the manager stands and watches the match, delivering key messages and instructions to those on the pitch. I've often found myself outside the technical area, which you're not actually supposed to do. It's designed to keep you in a, in a space and stop you from uh, running down the touchline, celebrating a goal. But we, we often get carried away and we often do that. Today, my friend, Rev Brad, long-time chaplain to the game of football, is going to break down a particular piece of the Bible. He'll deliver some coaching and counselling instruction for those of us who are part of the beautiful game in a way that is applicable to our lives today. So grab a Bible, strap on your boots, and focus for a moment on the technical area. Hello, Rev Brad here. Hopefully you are doing well today. Uh, as I record, we're at the startup of another season in Premier League, which means we're toward the tail end of the league season here in the U.S. Our professional teams are starting the playoff push and the drive. And our technical area topic for today is choosing your starting 11. So for many years, as I've coached and counseled different executives, coaches, technical directors, and athletes, invariably there comes this point in our conversation where I encourage a person to name their starting 11. It's a little bit of an exercise that I've kind of developed. And essentially, the starting 11 are the people that are in our lives that we trot out, in a sense, in different moments and situations of life that we face. The 11 could be a parent, family member, friends, coaches, mentors, other people who have a significant voice or role in our lives, even dead people, quote unquote, you know, writers, musicians, they can even be part of this team. So each one of them, though, they really occupy a certain space on the field of our lives on the pitch. And their designation is really to perform a certain task, which is centered around being part of our team. Some of my favorite moments of working through this exercise can sometimes happen with a young academy player. Uh, you know, here's a young person maybe that doesn't feel as though they've got enough support in their life for any number of reasons. And I found this is a really helpful exercise to have them name or write out a starting 11 and then to empower them for that particular role that uh, that person's going to need to play in their life in a given moment or situation. So now with a little bit of that setup, I want to dive into a place in scripture where we see this happening. Uh, if you've got a Bible, grab a Bible, grab the app, grab a paper copy, uh, wherever it is, we're going to be looking at the gospel of Mark chapter three, verses 13 through 19. So while you're finding that, or maybe setting up to take some notes, let me offer some background and context. In our passage today, we're going to see Jesus calling and appointing the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples. Now, before we go starting pointing out the obvious, yes, Jesus picks 12. I'm talking about a starting 11. So the numbers don't exactly match, but hopefully you're going to avoid picking a Judas. Uh, I'll say more about that in a moment. We're going with the gospel of Mark in this case for a few reasons. First, Mark gets to the 12 more quickly than any of the other gospel accounts. We can read uh, some of the same account of Jesus choosing the 12 in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. And the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. But Mark, likely being the first gospel account that was written down and recorded, also gives us a little bit more detail, and he just gets there a little bit more quickly. So uh, if you want to try and glean a little bit more, learn a little bit more, check out Matthew 10, Luke 6. You'll get a little bit more full of a picture. But I think Mark does a pretty good job, and we're going to use his detail in the technical area today. Second bit of context. So Jesus has already called a few guys to follow him already. Uh, he's, he's known to these 12 that we're going to read about, and some of them have already been interacting with Jesus. They've been seeing some of his work, hearing his message, but it's like this becomes an official moment. This is Jesus naming the squad or turning in the squad sheet for the match. And there's a couple lessons for us in this, and that's where I want to land today with the technical area. In the immediate context, we see that many people have been drawn to Jesus, 
He's been healing people. He's been stirring things up with the local religious leaders. They're starting to question him. They're looking into this renegade rabbi. And so the time of the selection of these men as apostles comes at a pivotal time at the beginning stages of Jesus's ministry. Oh, an apostle is only used two times in Mark. It really just means messenger. So these are authorized agents or ambassadors of Jesus. He's training them, sending them out to share the message with other people. So there's an element of learning and an element of doing, teaching, speaking, healing, etc. Finally, I don't think there's going to be enough time today to fully get into the different people and choices that Jesus makes for who makes up the team. I think that's going to have to come later on a different podcast, but we're going to look at a few general principles to glean from the selections that Jesus makes. Okay, so let's dive in. We're going to read Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. I'm reading from the NIV, starting in verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. That's our text for today. So, okay, let's look at a few elements present within the text. Again, if this is, this is only the second time we've done the technical area, so I'm going to get into a point of examining the different elements that are in the text without trying to make too much, uh, you know, parallels or applications. We're going to save application to, to follow right on from here. So, here's a few elements present within the text. First thing, Jesus goes up on a mountainside. Now, We don't know what mountain this is exactly. It's not right to put too much significance to it. But we've seen this earlier uh, and later in Mark and in some of the other Gospels. Jesus has a good habit, a good tendency, a good rhythm to get away. He gets away to mountainsides. He gets to solitary places. And the things he does here, he prays, he talks to the Father, he talks to God. Um, So let's consider, though, for a moment, what a mountainside might offer or why this um, geographical place is, is important or maybe has a little bit of significance. You know, certainly there's other parts of the story with God where important things happen on a mountain. Think about God giving the Ten Commandments or God speaking to a prophet or the mountain was a, a place of refuge, safety, security. Mountains too offer a place of retreat. They offer a perspective and view that is different from being in the valley, being low. I live in Denver, Colorado. And, uh, you know, where I, where I live, my home sits a, l- a little bit more than a mile high, but we have this constant, beautiful view of the front range, Rocky mountains. And I go up into the mountains for many different reasons and occasions in the summer, the mountains offer a cooler place, escape from the summertime heat in the winter. There's plenty of recreation between skiing and winter sport. I tend to go up into the mountains to relax, unwind, uh, seek vision to kind of get refreshed for, for ways forward. It might be that Jesus goes up on the mountain to get perspective. Uh, Maybe as he considers the people he's going to invite into this intimate relationship, you know, he's essentially doing life with these people. The mountains may offer a place to get away from the crowds, to get away from the noise and distraction of village life, to think, to pray, and to make these selections. Well, the second thing that we note, Jesus chooses those he wanted. We understand from the text that each of these individuals that gets named are men of Jesus' choosing. You know, I think there's a lot of people already following Jesus. And maybe there were many more that would have wanted to be taught by Jesus, but these are men that Jesus selects. It doesn't mean that he doesn't teach and, you know, maybe someone's standing in the crowd and they're hearing his instruction, they're hearing some story that he's telling, but these these people are right with Jesus, they're living with Jesus, and he's explaining things to them, he's teaching them in a more intimate, specific way. You know, back in these times, young Jewish boys were instructed in religious training religious things up to about the age of 12. That's the time they become a man. If if a boy showed particular promise, a rabbi might take that boy under his wing and continue his education. And it was really considered a a special honor. 
you know, one day this, this boy might, as he grows up into being a man, he might one day up, end up serving the local synagogue or even becoming a priest, you know, kind of dependent on a few things. But if, if a boy didn't show quite that promise, they ended up going a different pathway. They went into a trade. And usually it was what dad was doing, the family business. So when we see Jesus calling these guys, we understand that most of them are older than 12 and they're beyond the point of being quote unquote called or selected by a rabbi and receiving that extra training and instruction. Uh, we, we see it in a few places here early in Mark and in other parts of the gospel. We see Peter, Andrew, James, and John, for example, they're fishermen, not the most glorious occupation amongst the trades. And the other disciples are involved too in other various capacities and industries. But Jesus calling them is like calling the religious school dropouts. And it it carries a little bit of distinction and honor. It's kind of like special to be recognized by Jesus and to be called into being part of this intimate group, this, this, this 12, so to speak. Well, the third element we see in verse 13 is that these men came to Jesus. Now, you know, if you're like me, you, you might quickly read past this, but to come to Jesus as he called them, it was like enlisting. I mean, these men were commi- committing to a deeper, more intentional relationship with Jesus. Essentially, these men were leaving their lives, their livelihoods. They were leaving goals, dreams, ambitions. They were leaving these things to follow Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't ever go back to, you know, fishing a little bit or but essentially what they're going to be doing is really an unpaid internship for a few years. And they're laying down the safety and security of all that maybe had come with growing into their trade to follow Jesus. Now, some of these guys were, were probably pretty young. They could have been, you know, late teenagers or so, but, but in the sense that they were already kind of out of that window of being selected by the rabbi, they were into their trade, Jesus picking them, ah, it's, it's going to be special and they're going to be instructed and taught. They're going to practice what he's teaching them. And in many ways, they're going to live with Jesus, travel with him, and, and all while they're delivering this message of the gospel. Okay, so we've seen three aspects of Jesus making the call, making the selection, and out of this text, we see three other helpful bits that give us a little bit of a template for considering this passage. So, in the appointment of the 12, there are three elements present. First, they will be, quote unquote, with Jesus. I said this before, but essentially they're going to live together, eat together, travel together, work together. It's about doing life and being in community and fellowship. It's about being part of a team. The second is that Jesus is going to send them out to preach. Uh, They're going to be ambassadors of his message. They're going to spread out, seek people. They're going to, they're going to listen and dialogue with them and go back and forth a little bit. All of it is about the message of the gospel. Essentially the kingdom is coming and, and it's here. And Jesus is here. And let us show you and tell you about this person that that we're living with, that we're following, and and the change that comes to our lives. The third element here is that um, these 12 are going to have authority to drive out demons. Essentially, they're going to carry Jesus's authority to provide healing and to help people that have been plagued in several demonic ways. The latter part of this passage then goes through the names. And there might be something to pay attention here to in the order. Um, Simon, known as Peter, is listed first. Now, at the time Mark is writing this gospel, Peter's a leader of the church. And Mark might be giving us a little bit of the hierarchical order here. It's also believed or it, it's well thought that Mark was close friends with Peter. That's where he gets a lot of his, his content. Peter's the source. So, you know, Peter's often recounting the stories to Mark. So, Mark might be putting Peter up here at the front of the list for a number of reasons, including, you know, maybe how well he knows Peter or how he's one of the key leaders of the early church. The list goes on. James and John are listed. These are the brothers, sons of Zebedee, and they have a nickname from Jesus. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Boanerges means sons of thunder. So, you know, maybe it's that they were a bit feisty or had a temper or they were passionate Whatever it is, Jesus kind of gives them this nickname and, and Mark talks about it. You know, is this, is this Peter slipping in a little bit of side information to Mark? Like, hey, you know, those guys, are, they're known as sons of thunder. We, we don't know for sure. But um, it's an interesting little detail to pick up on. Uh, then we see the rest of the, the list kind of get rounded out with the disciples. And it, it ends with Judas the betrayer. Now, again, I've said, 
I mean, I mentioned Judas. Um, th- does that mean that, uh, you know, in the starting 11, as we pick them, we'll get into application in a little bit. Like w- we just totally can't, can't pick the betrayers. Well, w- we don't know these people sometimes. Do we know that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him? I don't know if he knew right at the beginning. He knew at some point for sure, but there, that's a little bit of detail here. We, we, we get some more on these original 12, but not too much. We've, we've got to con- kind of combine other gospel accounts to kind of figure them out. And again, as I said, their stories or personalities we're going to have to cover a- at a different time. Suffice it to say that Jesus chooses them and he calls them uh, really to a specific lifestyle, which represents a massive change from what they're, what they're currently doing. And so they respond to Jesus. They start to follow him and they start to be in his company, so to speak, on the team. Well, let's get into some application now. Remember, we're talking about choosing our own starting 11. Uh, These are the people that are going to be part of our lives in a special and unique way. And and I believe really we can learn a few things from this example of Jesus here in Mark chapter 3. First, there are a lot of people we might choose to be part of our crew, crowds of people. We have to be selective. So really, I I think one of the first things we see is that we might need to get to a place where we can have some perspective. Again, I'm not trying to make a big deal about the mountainside that Jesus goes to, but there's something telling that Jesus doesn't simply stand in the marketplace or the village and makes his decision there or makes his choices there. Part of me imagines that Jesus in making the mountainside the place of choosing you know, maybe he's setting up an environment to get away from the crowds a little bit, to get away from the hubbub of everyday normal life. N- not only is getting away from the crowds for Jesus is good, but maybe too for the person that might be let down that they're not going to be part of the 12. Think about it for a moment. You're an executive about to hire a new coach, a new manager, or, or maybe it's another kind of staff person at the club. Getting away into that mountain setting might help give you perspective. It might get away from the regular mundane everyday distraction. It might help you to focus when you make that final appeal, the call. It, it also allows the person to be able to respond in a positive way, again, without those distractions, without those annoyances that get in the way. It might also give you the space when you need to make the other calls, you know, the negative ones that say, hey, thanks for your inquiry and interest, but we're going a different direction. So uh, thanks again for applying. Now, now think of this in a more personal way. You know, as you're picking your starting 11, maybe there's a setting, a place for you that has some significance. It's a quiet place. It's a restful, peaceful place. It's a mountain, a beach. A, maybe it's a church or a building or another kind of special place. It's a place where you can rest, retreat. It, it, again, it has a little bit of quiet to it, or maybe there's a little bit of company to it. Whatever you might need. Make sure that there's a special place when you're picking out your starting 11. Make sure it's not, you know, r- the car ride from the stadium or it's, you know, in, in the midst of your home with kids and other people bopping around and, and making a, a bunch of noise. Another aspect, we don't necessarily see it in this text, but Jesus often prays when he goes on a mountaintop. So I'm encouraging you make prayer a part of your thought and reflection around this. You know, if you're going to add someone to your team, to your starting 11, we got to pray about it. Take some time for discernment, but ask God, hey, is this person a right fit, a right choice for me? Ask yourself, you know, have I got good perspective? Am, am, Am I in a good place to see these things? I'm inviting these people to do life with me, to speak into things. So I just encourage you again, Put this up to God in prayer, think through it, and make sure that you're kind of in that unique, unique place where you can do those things. Okay, on to number two. If we look and follow Jesus's lead, he selects people that he wants. I think this means that he knows something about them. Now, sometimes when we're young, we barely know what we want ourselves. We may not have the maturity to select out a great team. I recall one time I was going through this exercise with a young person. They wanted to select a rap artist to be part of their starting 11. Uh, okay, you know, I said, but tell me, what role are they going to serve or how are they going to help build out your team and, and help you in a particular moment? Well, I just like their music. That was the reply. Oh, okay, that's fine and all. But as I encourage this person, that's not the strongest argument to put someone into your squad. Uh, you know, another note is this, you know, sometimes we limit ourselves with a person that seems out of reach. 
But I think we can creatively look at some people as role models or examples. And if they've written something, published something, they podcast, it may not be a stretch to quote unquote name them to the squad. So if you're a young person selecting your first starting 11, maybe ask for some help from a trusted advisor, a parent, a grandparent, coach, even a chaplain like myself. And if you're older and wiser, hopefully you've learned that we need to surround ourselves with people who are different enough from ourselves to help enrich our lives and support us in key moments and in ways that we may not be able to do very well ourselves. Okay, on to application point number three. There may be people that we invite into our starting 11 that reject us or excuse themselves and refuse us. Rejection can be hard. Don't get me wrong. But please don't let that discourage you from from going through with this exercise. Oftentimes when one door closes, it's really so that our eyes might be open to another one. And I think God leads us in key moments into relationship with people that can help us on our journey. It might be that the person you had thought of at first and and you thought, I'm going to make them my selection. They're not really a good fit. There's actually someone better, someone that would be more engaged, someone that's going to serve as a better team player for you. So let that person's response to your invitation Let that be a bit of a litmus test. And, you know, of course, you've got to lay out what what the starting 11, what this relationship means, what it looks like. But many times if if you see that someone says, hey, I just don't think that's for me right now, or I don't have the time for that, that's okay. Um, And that's why we have a reserve squad, right? That's why we have other names that we want to call up. Uh, Also to realize a lot of times in mentoring situations, the responsibility really rests with the mentee, to bring the issues, the desires, the coaching points into the conversation. The mentor can draw from a wealth of experience or knowledge, but they're not necessarily in the day-to-day with the mentee. So so really the responsibility is we're naming that starting 11, we're going to have to bring it. We're going to have to be on top of our game and say, hey, this is where I'm going to need help, and, and I believe this is how you can help me. So I know I'm using several words synonymously, or, or they kind of overlap, coach, coaching, mentoring, et cetera. Uh, keep up with me though here. Uh, it's okay that there's a little bit of overlap in these ideas. Again, we're picking out a starting 11 and, and we want to build out a solid squad. So let me get in the last three application points and then I'm going to uh, I'm gonna try and work through these a little bit more quickly. I think the first one is simple. You're inviting people to do life with you. Now, if you're part of a football team, if you're, if you're part of a soccer team, right? Like this, this part of life you get, the locker room, like you're, you're in a, especially in the professional game, you're, you're together from, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 months out of the year sometimes. So as we're thinking about this in other ways, though, you have to think that these starting 11 are going to be incorporated somehow into your daily life. Uh, for example, for a long time, I've claimed C.S. Lewis is part of my starting 11. The British writer and theologian really has connected to me through his books, some of the ways he's explained some tough issues. But here's the thing. Lewis is dead. Now, his books are still around, so part of having Lewis in my squad is making sure I continue to read him, to wrestle with some of the things he wrote, to remind myself, to refresh myself on some of the things he said. Here's another example. I have a pastor friend of mine. His name is Mike. Mike and I make sure we spend ample time together throughout the month. We might go play disc golf together. We might eat a meal or see each other at church meetings. Mike and I have been in each other's homes. We've shared life together. And Mike has this unique insight into me, my marriage, my family, my parenting. And this really allows Mike to be a great team player and part of my starting 11 because he can speak into things and he's from a, a unique position and a unique privilege. The second application point is a little bit more of a stretch to make. Um, now, we're not raising people up as part of our starting 11 to go out and preach anything about us. Um, of course, if you're part of a branding team, you might think, yeah, that's, that's us. But the people in our starting 11 are our advocates. Let me say that again. Our starting 11, my starting 11, these are my advocates, my biggest supporters. They, at times, will be representing me at different levels and in different ways. Again, another example from my pastor friend, Mike. He once shared with this group, he said, you know, I think we should extend an invitation for Brad to join the group. We're all a bunch of pastors operating outside the walls of the church. And so Mike was thinking about me. He's thinking about my role, thinking about the things that I do. And so he started telling about my work to others and saying, hey, I think we could support Brad by inviting him into our group. So Mike was there 
acting as an advocate for me. And, and the people of our starting 11 really need to be some of our best cheerleaders and promoters. So you can't pick all dead writers or, or musicians or artists or anything. You, you've got to have some living people on your starting 11. And, and you know, it's amazing. When I sit with young athletes and we go through this exercise, sometimes the starting 11 is comprised of mom, dad, and, and uh, mom and dad's parents, you know, the grandparents. And so in many cases, that's a good six people to name to the squad. And that's a great start. We want friends, family members, coaches, mentors who are on our side and ready to go to bat for us. They are our ambassadors and representatives on many levels. Okay, so let's get into the final application point to make today. Now, to be honest, sometimes when people hear or read of things like the authority to drive out demons, we get certain pictures and images in our head. Uh, Some people may roll their eyes. Uh, Some people may get into more extreme examples thinking, oh, what was that latest horror movie I saw that Hollywood's put out about exorcism or something? Now, both of those are are just extreme ideas um, and, and probably a little bit wrong. Let, let me pull a quote from one of my starting 11, C.S. Lewis. I've mentioned him. He, he writes this about demons in his preface to Screwtape Letters. Uh, Screwtape Letters is a fictional book account of these letters exchanged between a senior demon and a junior demon. And the senior demon is, is coaching the junior demon and how to kind of afflict his, his patient, his human person with all sorts of things. So Lewis writes this in the preface, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So now to some specific application. Those on our starting eleven, as it relates to this thing that Jesus does with the apostles, with the with the twelve, our starting eleven have to be given authority. Uh, let me say it in a different way: we have to give our starting eleven permission to speak into our lives. Sometimes they need to come to us with a hard word, a stern word. Sometimes they need to warn us or uh, exhort us. They need to be the ones who are turning us around when we get off course or we start going astray. It does no good to name someone to the starting 11, and then we don't listen to them when they're giving us wisdom or advice that we really need to pay attention to. As you and I name people to our starting 11, we need to set them up and ourselves for success by giving them the authority to call us out on certain things, to coach us, to mentor us. Let me give you an easy, simple example. I love the game of disc golf. I've mentioned it. I started playing it later in my life, in my 30s. Uh, I wish I could go pro, but yeah, it won't happen. In the beginning, though, I'm playing with my, my other friends. We're learning the game, and I was quite poor at a number of aspects of the game. So one year, a friend of mine, he, he was once ranked as high as number 14 in the world, I think. He came out to Colorado for a few days, and he spent the time teaching us and playing different rounds of disc golf with us. And so he would give us pointers and tips. And he spoke into my game, and there are a number of lessons I learned from just those short two days that helped me improve tremendously in how I play the game today. But I gave him authority to call me out. Hey, that's a bad habit. Or, hey, try this instead of, you know, this bad this practice you got over here, like, try this instead. And as I asked him to help me improve, and as I worked on those things, he was able to help change and transform the way I play the game. In a similar fashion, beyond the pitch, we need to have, in our starting 11, the people need to be able to speak truth into our lives and to literally and figuratively, in some ways, cast out some demons that might be plaguing us. We need people to call us out if we're drinking too much or we're overweight from overeating or maybe we're lax in our off-season plan or program. We, we need people on our starting 11 to call us out when we have wrong ideas about God and faith. We need someone on our starting 11 to challenge us when we're not being a good partner or a good parent. And, you know, the list goes on for whatever stage of life and whatever place in life you're in. Well, let me wrap up with a quick summary from our text here in Mark chapter 3 and this idea of naming our starting 11. Principle number one, get to a place, a special place, where clarity and perspective can happen when you're choosing the people that are going to come around you and support you and be part of your starting 11. Number two, take some time, pray, and pick out those that you want around you. People are going to contribute something tangible to your life to your faith, to your family, to your football. 
Number three, if rejection happens, it's okay. But somehow, get some buy-in from these people. Have them accept the role, the journey, the position you're going to have them play as a part of the, your team out on the field. Fourthly, remember that these are people to do life with. Spend time with them. Have them into your home. Uh, go to a coffee shop. Like, get time with them. That's, that's key. That's important. Do life. Number five, these folks really should be your biggest cheerleaders, supporters, your biggest advocates. But finally, remember this too, number six, they also need permission to speak truth in your life and call you out when you're too far afield to, to, to help get those demons out of your life. Well, friends, it can be a great exercise to select a starting 11. Remember, you can roll out whatever formation is most beneficial for you in the season of life. But if we look at Jesus' example here in Mark 3, I think we see some really interesting aspects of how he names the 12 and how we can make some great applications for our own lives. So get up on that mountainside, pray, make the selections, and get busy with your own starting 11. Thanks for listening to Rev Brad in the technical area. Don't forget to give the podcast a rating and review and check out for more content on soccerchaplainsunited.org. This is Adam Smith signing off. Goodbye for now.